Thank you for joining us for this special edition of KPBS News. I'm Maya Trabulsi. It has been a week of major developments and milestones in the battle against COVID-19. California reached 1 million cases since the start of the pandemic, and there is some progress toward a vaccine, with Pfizer announcing its version is 90 percent effective. But its rollout will take a while. And in the meantime, local cases are surging. As a result, San Diego County will slide into the state's most restrictive purple tier. KPBS investigative reporter Claire Tregesser looks at how that happened. It was the middle of the afternoon, and El Toro Grill Taqueria in City Heights was completely empty of customers. Still, owner Maribel Estrada was hustling through her small restaurant. She took orders over the phone and through a walk-up ordering window she'd made that opened to the street. Right now we only have 25% open to the public inside, which for us is only a three tables available. That's basically it. And uh, it's, it's now it's helping a little bit, but not as much as before. Unfortunately, Estrada can kiss those three tables goodbye for the time being. San Diego County has sunk back to the dreaded purple tier, the worst possible ranking in California's system meant to control COVID-19 spread. For months, San Diego County stayed in a narrow range, teetering on the edge of the red and purple tiers. Yet, we haven't seen a huge surge in cases or hospitalizations, as is happening in other parts of the country which is exactly what the tier system is meant to prevent, says San Diego County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher. Uh, the tiered system is designed to, to have those checks that stop you before you hit true exponential spread and, and growth. And, and so I, I, think, I think the system works, and I think the system is working well uh, for California right now. Along with the tier system keeping restrictions in place based on case counts, the San Diego region has good weather on its side. Rebecca Fielding Miller is an epidemiologist at UC San Diego. She says good weather helps people stay outside where COVID-19 is far less likely to spread. During those big heat waves, we had uh, big spikes in cases because you can assume that if it's 100 degrees in San Diego, people are going to go inside where, where there's air conditioning and because there's recirculated air, there's a better chance for um, infection. The heat wave that we had in late September, you can see there was um, cases climbed quite a bit right after that. So you can actually kind of see this pattern a little bit in the data. As rain and colder weather comes in the next few months, Fielding Miller worries that more people will take their gatherings inside, which could increase spread. Fletcher says he hopes the tier system doesn't come under attack if that does happen. We've got to recognize and understand that there there is no economic recovery when you have increasing cases. Um, and that's not just because of the tiered system and the restrictions, but that's the general public uh, that is not comfortable and confident being willing to go out and do these types of things. Fletcher added that he believes the county would have been better off if it had opened more gradually in July when the tier system was implemented, rather than immediately opening all establishments that were allowed under the red tier. We opened everything associated with red on August 28th, the very first day we could, and, and I strongly felt that we needed to wait. We were on a downward trajectory. Get down to where you have really low spread, and then when you have really low spread, then you can be a little bit more open with some of the things you're doing um, without the risk of closing people down. That may be true, but El Toro Grill owner Estrada isn't sure she can hang on much longer. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of space outside on the uh, sidewalk, but we ended up having four tables outside. Uh, but it's kind of like we have a lot of issues here for people pass by. We have a lot of trouble with homeless. She and her husband have run the restaurant for 10 years, but without indoor dining, she says they could close in a matter of months. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. Also, San Diego County has launched a new online dashboard, and you can see the local case rates broken down by zip code. Case rates are the metric that determine which tier our county will operate under. It's updated weekly. KPBS is also updating overall cases and other information as it comes in daily. That's part of the Tracking COVID-19 section at kpbs.org, where you'll also find all our recent stories.
There's no sign of Congress passing a new COVID stimulus bill anytime soon, and that means financial help that was available in the spring might not be there as more businesses are required to close or limit their operations. We have two stories from KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman on those who are following and resisting the new rules. You want to come to a space where it's a bit of a sanctuary from your normal life. And so although it's been a crazy year, we've tried to kind of maintain that sanctuary feel. At Point Loma Sports Club, preparations are underway to move all operations outside by Saturday. And make sure our members are safe and our team members are safe. Um, over the last six months, it's not been easy. But uh, you adapt, right? So you have to, in order to thrive, you have to adapt. Adapting meant adding this outdoor workout space that has 120,000 pounds of equipment in their Liberty Station parking lot. Our mindset was, let's assume we're outside for a year. The sports club has also moved group classes outdoors too. And with San Diego weather, it's pretty hard to beat. Woo! Add one year up right here. We require masks basically throughout the facility, even outdoors and just have kind of preached that, that mantra that it's like, I'm not doing it just for me, I'm doing it for you and for your family. While some have frozen their memberships, Point Loma Sports Club has added some new members who are happy that they're strictly enforcing wearing face coverings and sanitizing equipment. They've been good with that since they reopened day one, and so I've kind of just stayed here. Point Loma resident Nate DeMelfi was going to another gym before this, but... I didn't necessarily feel safe there. I felt very much on edge. There are some gyms that just don't have this availability to go outside or to afford necessarily this amount of sanitization equipment. For DeMelfi, the gym is a place that's important for not only his physical health, but also his mental health. And he's grateful that places like Point Loma Sports Club are adapting during the pandemic and rising cases. Part of the reason why I even started coming, I was in a really low place uh, mentally uh, during high school. And so I started coming to the gym to get out any anxiety, stress, since we are technically in winter, management is looking to add some rain guards and heaters for the outside workout space. They'll be outdoors only starting Saturday until San Diego County exits the state's purple tier, which won't be for at least three weeks. It's just not justified. Peter San Nicolas of Ramona Fitness Center is one of the many business owners weighing whether or not to comply with looming closure orders this weekend. They have to look at the other side of if we do this, what is the effect? And then they, they just like brush it under the rug. Back in August, San Nicolas was charged by the district attorney's office for violating a different closure order, but those charges were later dropped. He's also joined other San Diego County gyms in a lawsuit against the state, arguing that restrictions are crippling his business. We get through a good time of year with January, February, March, you know, like New Year's, people coming back. I'll be able to see, OK, are, are we going to be able to make it? Now, with this shutdown, I don't know, you know, I'm, I, but I'm not going to quit. It's not only gyms, restaurants, churches, and movie theaters have to stop all indoor operations by Saturday. San Nicolas says owners of those businesses are facing some tough choices. So we could close down and then possibly just go out of business. For a lot of people, that's what that's going to mean. Or you could stay open and, yes, go against the orders and maybe still be put out of business. So what's the risk? We're gonna, we could possibly fail either way. So what do we have to lose? Just down the street at Mama Ramona's restaurant, owner Andrew Simmons is getting ready to close his dining room. You know, I would love to stay open, um, but I don't think that the county will allow us and I can't afford to have my restaurant shut down. Simmons bought this Italian eatery the month before the pandemic hit. Um, we haven't really made money since buying the restaurant. It's been a, a loss for us every month. He's actually taken on a new challenge to cover the restaurant's losses, selling online Amazon returns. So those sales actually help supplement our you know, regular sales so that you know we're only losing five or ten thousand dollars a month instead of twenty or thirty thousand dollars a month. Simmons will move exclusively to takeout delivery and outside seating this weekend. <laughs> Business owners are planning another reopen San Diego rally outside the county building on Monday. There they'll be demanding local control over coronavirus closures and future restrictions. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. San Diego's legal system will not be interrupted by the purple tier. San Diego Superior Court says there will be no additional closures or changes to court schedules. That's a change from earlier this year when most court business was put on hold. Many COVID-19 precautions will remain in place, including temperature checks, more frequent cleaning and mandatory face coverings. 
If you're thinking about changing your health care plan, you should know that open enrollment for covered California is now available. One and a half million Californians have already enrolled through the state's market for the Affordable Care Act. State officials kicked off their push this week, encouraging people to find out if they qualify to have the government help pay for their health insurance. They say the pandemic has shed light on how expensive it can be. Those who are hospitalized because of COVID and do not have health insurance or the special cost sharing protections that have been put in place for COVID could walk out with very large bills. This fact puts a spotlight on the high cost of health care, which is why everyone should have health insurance. You can see the available plans by logging onto CoveredCA.com. Health officials are urging people to sign up by December 15th to start coverage on January 1st. COVID-19 canceled many events that were planned at the Del Mar Fairgrounds. Now, as North County reporter Tanya Thorne tells us, organizers are working out what next year will look like. As the San Diego County Fair and large events vanished due to COVID-19, so did major earnings for the Del Mar Fairgrounds. COVID certainly has not helped um, in terms of things, but you know we're just continuing to work through it on, on a daily basis, really. By the end of the year, the state-owned fairgrounds are expected to see a 90% loss of forecasted earnings. This has forced large staff layoffs, leaving only 15% of staff to handle the events that can still happen with COVID restrictions. Today we know drive-through events, drive-in events, you know, activities of that nature, open space, you know, these are all going to be really key and important things in the near future for the foreseeable future. <laughs> The recent drive through Scream Zone was highly successful, and the upcoming Holidays in Your Car drive through light show is expected to draw some crowds. The grounds continue to hold crowdless horse races, drive-in movies and concerts, and retail events such as Snow Jam, all with COVID restrictions for visitors. Moore says a COVID version of the fair is expected this summer. We can um, sort of reshape events that we have had historically to fit into what is allowed to happen in terms of activities, depending on what the public health orders are at the time. Another change that could be coming to the fairgrounds is a proposal to build affordable housing on the property. The city of Del Mar currently has no affordable housing and faces state penalties. Some proposed sites would be on the outskirts of the fairgrounds, where residential use wouldn't interfere with the use of the fairgrounds and future events. Moore says it could be another three to four years before anything is set in stone. In Del Mar, Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. Most museums will be closed this weekend, in some cases for the second time. KPBS reporter John Carroll spoke to the head of the Air and Space Museum, who says the one-size-fits-all method of determining closures does not work. San Diego's Air and Space Museum is an airy place. When you're displaying airplanes, having high ceilings is a must. The roof of the center pavilion isn't sealed to the building. Fresh air is always circulating up there, unless it rains, and then they bring out a canvas cover. Not every structure is the same. Not every organization is the same. Museum president and CEO Jim Kidrick says the museum follows the strictest COVID guidelines. And he says since it reopened in June, there have been no COVID outbreaks traced back to the museum. Kidrick says he and his management team considered appealing to the county to be able to stay open, but decided against it in the end. It was a challenging decision. We don't necessarily believe in it, but we're going to stick with our community, and that's very, very important to us. Kidrick says the decision to not fight the order, to go ahead and close again, was agonizing. He worries about his employees, and he says the museum should be viewed as an essential business. You know, we're an educational field trip. You know, we're an opportunity. We're socially distanced. Uh, we're, um, we're a perfect environment, okay, for that STEM learning, okay, because we're kind of the practical application of uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now that we're in the purple tier, the only places that'll stay open in Balboa Park are the Japanese Friendship Garden and the parts of the zoo that are outdoors. The other museums are either already closed or will close beginning Saturday. So is San Diego in danger of losing any of its museums? I talked to a representative from the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership. They are an umbrella group representing most of the museums in the park. And they told me that for now, the museums are pretty much hanging in there. Here at the Model Railroad Museum, they've actually launched a capital campaign to raise $40,000. 
Many of the museums are doing a lot in the virtual world right now, including selling merchandise, stealing themselves for months more of no visitors, and looking forward to the day when they can hang banners like this once again. John Carroll, KPBS News. The San Diego Unified School District is moving forward with an ambitious plan to test all 100,000 students and 10,000 staff members. The school board approved $5 million to pay for the tests. The goal is to test everyone twice a week. San Diego Unified is reopening its schools in phases, and right now only elementary students with the greatest needs are receiving on-campus instruction. Higher grade levels will be added in the coming weeks if the county can exit the purple tier. When the pandemic first closed down San Diego County schools, it meant school buses were left idle for months. But as districts gradually resume in-person instruction, transportation departments had to figure out how to keep their buses virus-free. KPBS education reporter Joe Hong visited one district to learn how it's taken cleanliness to a whole new level. At Powell Unified School District's Transportation Center, 152 school buses are parked in long rows. <laughs> Before the pandemic arrived in March, these buses transported more than 4,000 students a day. But the district's bus routes came to a halt when campuses closed. Now, months later, they're finally rubbing up their engines again. Since mid-October, when the district opened its elementary schools, buses have been taking about 500 students to and from school. Kim Denson is a bus driver with the district. She said she had some concerns at first about how the kids would react to the new rules. Were they going to be able to keep a face mask on? Are they going to be able to social distance themselves? You know, um, how they were just going to react to us screening them inside the mornings and everything. So I drive special needs and it can be a little bit more trying for them than other kids. But so far, Denson has felt completely safe during her routes. Students are pre-screened with temperature and symptom checks before boarding, and they're doing a good job of following the rules. She says it also helps that the department is being extra careful with hygiene. After each bus disembark, every child disembarks the bus and we come up, we just go up and we have to make sure that every seat is just sprayed down. Okay, and this has to sit on here for five minutes. In addition to drivers disinfecting surfaces after each trip, buses get a deep cleaning every 24 hours with a device that looks like it came out of Ghostbusters. Tyler Bouquet is a vehicle maintenance coordinator at Poway Unified. This machine puts out a fog, and so it's going to cover every knit corner, under the seat, anywhere in the bus is going to be covered in disinfectant places you normally wouldn't be able to reach by hand or you may miss in the process. But it's not a typical fog. The particles are electrostatically charged. So the electrostatic part causes them to stick to every surface in the bus. So you don't have to, even if you don't point at that surface, it's still gonna fog out and touch everything and stick to it and make sure every surface is uh, comes, comes in contact with disinfectant. These disinfecting measures have come at a cost for Poway Unified. The Transportation Department has spent more than $45,000 on COVID-related supplies. The district has also lost over a million dollars in revenue from the lack of bus pass sales. Tim Purvis is the Transportation Director at the district. We want our students back on our buses and um, uh, we don't want the parent feeling that they have to drive their child and their automobile and getting clogged in that traffic at our school sites and everything. We want them to have that same confidence that when they're ready to return their child to a PUSD school site, that includes the bus to go with it. They'll face an even greater challenge if and when the district opens middle and high schools. But Purvis says they're ready. Our driver is key in this, absolutely key. And the parent having that confidence that that driver is assuring the safety of their child. Other districts are also grappling with how to figure out bus operations. Cajon Valley Union, a K-8 district in East County, reopened all of its schools in September but lost 80% of its bus riders. At San Diego Unified, a limited number of schools have opened for in-person instruction, and a small number of students are riding the bus regularly. For the most part, the district's school buses have been used to deliver food and school supplies. Joe Hong, KPBS News. Young people in City Heights are raising their voice and using a virtual space to express their needs. KPBS reporter Max Rivlin Nadler explains why their issues have only become more urgent during the pandemic. 
the group Youth for Change began serving City Heights youth in 2016, after young people in the community signaled they weren't being listened to by community leaders. That survey found common ground among youth on the need for changes in law enforcement, street safety, cleanliness, and educational opportunities. Now, it's been turned into a virtual exhibition by young photographers, after a physical exhibition was postponed in late March, just as the pandemic was taking hold. They have something to say and they need somebody to listen to what they have to say and that to be included. Famo Musa is one of the organizers for City Heights Youth for Change, an assistant teacher at AJA, a youth photography organization and partner on this project. Musa says the virtual exhibition is an opportunity for the community to see through the eyes of young people who are hurting during the pandemic but have receded from public view with schools and campuses closed. Since everything is online and virtual and more people are open to it, that now it's, pub it's more public. They, it, they, people can't ignore it anymore, basically. Now it's like they're in your face. You kind of have to listen to them. The photography exhibition will be accompanied by a puppet show from younger kids, also focusing on the same issues. Musa thinks young people, especially now that many are stuck at home, are becoming more interested in local politics and their community. And now I wish that I grew up that I was 18 at this time right now because I feel like now they have more confidence to speak out and to speak their mind. And now they are more, they're not just children anymore. They're growing and they're, they're growing within the society. Max Rivlin Adler, KPBS News. Wearable tech is playing a role in how we track the pandemic. Local scientists say smartwatches could predict the early signs of a person coming down with an infectious disease like coronavirus. KPBS science and technology reporter Shalina Chetlani has the story. The so-called DETECT study launched in late March and has looked at smartwatch or fitness device data on about 36,000 people. Scientists asked participants to track their health and symptoms through a mobile application and use that to monitor changes in heart rate, sleep, activity levels, and other vital signs. When someone goes to, say, their health care provider to get their um, vitals taken, it's kind of this artificial setting and a one-time measurement, but really... Um, um, from these devices, we have the ability to kind of better characterize what each person's individual um, typical values are and by tracking them continuously over time. Jennifer Radin, an epidemiologist with Scripps Research, says the study found the technology was fairly effective in showing whether a patient was becoming ill. But of course, more analysis is necessary. So right now we're heading into the start of flu season. And um, so many of the non-COVID cases in our data set um, are likely not flu cases. And once that um, starts circulating in the population, we'll have to better understand kind of how um, wearable changes with COVID compared to those with other viruses such as flu. Raiden says wearable devices aren't always that accurate, but she says that's not a problem because the user is contributing so much data. Scientists say they'd like more people to participate to verify this limited study. Shalina Chatlani, KPBS News. UC San Diego students, staff and faculty can use a COVID tracking program on their phones to tell them if they've been exposed to the virus. As KPBS reporter Claire Tregister tells us, the plan is to make this tool available statewide. The alert came through a few days after BC, a student at UCSD arrived on campus. A person you are recently near has reported they tested positive for COVID-19, it said. The message came from a program UC San Diego students, faculty, and staff can install on their phones to let them know if they've been near someone who tested positive for COVID-19. BC, who asked to be identified by her initials to protect her privacy, says she wasn't surprised by the news. My roommate told me that one of them one of the people we were with had tested positive, but so yeah, I was expecting it, but for someone who wasn't expecting it, that would, that would probably be really scary. Still, she appreciated the clear instructions from the alert. It's telling you next steps now. It's not just up to me. I was officially notified, you know. It's being piloted at UC San Diego and UC San Francisco with the eventual goal to expand to other UC campuses and eventually the entire state, says Dr. Christopher Longhurst, the chief information officer at UC San Diego. Like 
it, it is an aug augmentation to manual contact tracing, which works great for household contacts and you know people you live with and and people that you might eat lunch with because they're your best friends. Where um, contact tracing falls apart is people you don't know, right? It's the stranger at the, the grocery store or the bar or the restaurant or the college party. The university is going to great lengths to protect users' privacy to the point where it's hard for the school to know whether the program is having much impact. We don't actually know who's turned the app on, right? What we know is like who clicked on the website to like download the profile or the app. We're, we're fairly confident that we have north of 14,000 users at this point. The only thing UC San Diego does know is that so far, about 12 people have reported a positive case through the program. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. That's all for this special edition of KPBS News. For all of us here at KPBS, I'm Maya Trabulsi. Thank you for joining us and stay safe.